Hello everyone. Welcome to SPS 02. SPS means Sociological Perspective Series. We have started this series recently and we wish to focus on the social issues which are in news. The topic that we chose for today is Naxal Bari Movement. This topic has been in news quite often in one form of the or the other. Now Naxal Bari movement is a social movement. It is also known as Naxalism. We find the topic politics and society in both papers P1 and P2 and social movement is a topic under politics and society. Now what is politics? Politics, you may know that politics is related to government. So, when we talk about the political setup, we are actually trying to understand how a government functions, what constitutes a government, who is the ruler here, who makes rules or laws, who implements the laws and how is the organization done. Now you should know that in a democracy, if we talk of India, then the people, they elect the government and the government is known as a representative government because it represents the people of India. So the people elect the government, which is also known as the state and the state does not function in isolation. It functions with the help of a vehicle which is known as bureaucracy or the administration. You would know about it because you are aspiring to be a part of the bureaucracy. So you would like to contribute to the running of the government, to the implementation of the policies which the government frames. So in politics, we are studying about the government, the different forms of government, the organization and the administration of either a one state or parts of ones and also the regulation that means we are talking about the laws also. In India we have a center and we have many states. Now when we talk of politics immediately power comes into mind. Why? Because in politics, if there is one body, which is the state, which is governing or which is taking decisions, it is also known as the decision making body. So if it is taking decisions, then for whom is it taking decision or whom is it ruling? There is a body which is subordinate or below the state and that is the people. Now then what is power? Power is the ability to get one's will implemented. That means if I have a desire to do something, I should be able to do it. Now power is always in relation to someone. That means if I use power or I exert power, then it will always be in relation to someone or over someone. I will cause someone else to obey my order. That will be power. Now why would someone obey me? Someone would obey me if I occupy a position of authority. So here comes authority. When my position is defined by certain rules, I enjoy certain privileges because of my position. That means I have the authority to ask others to obey me. And this comes from the concept of legal rational authority given by Weber. 
in politics power plays a very important role and it is known as legal rational authority when we talk of state this is because the state has been given the right to rule because of let's say its people in a democracy so in short in politics state has the power or legal rational authority to rule over people it also has the right to mobilize the resources for the attainment of goal what would be this goal it could be economic development it could be construction of dams or construction of bridges railways roads all these things come under the mobilization of resources so it is possible only because the state has been given legal rational authority by the people and in india we are under the highest law of nature which is constitution so constitution is the source of authority for state now when we talk of politics and power and authority then we also come across several ideologies which are followed by those who are interested in entering politics people who want to come into power they follow certain ideologies these ideologies are broadly classified into three types first one is left second is center and third is right now these two left and right they are known to possess extreme views so they are also sometimes known as extremists while those at the center they try to maintain a balance between the views of left and right while the left it favors change it is in favor of political economic and social change the right they are against any kind of change they prefer status quo or they would like the current state of affairs to remain as it is the left they are mainly against capitalism they identify with the interests of the masses these masses could be workers or peasants one example is communism while the right they favor the interest of the established property classes or the capitalists they could be fascists in the left wing the change that they want to bring about could be either through constitutional means or revolutionary means so in today's topic we are mostly interested in this part the left wing ideology now how did the left wing come into being what do we know about its origin the first instant of any kind of revolution that we know is found in the french revolution if you would remember that before the french revolution we had three estates the clergy the nobility and the workers peasants businessmen merchants and everyone else there was a french revolution because of the oppression faced by the third estate and new classes came up these classes were the proletariat the middle class and the bourgeoisie now this revolution took place because the third estate experienced exploitation and it was believed that the class system would get rid of this exploitation but as marx studied the conditions at the factory the conditions of the workers he found that this exploitation had just changed its form it had not vanished 
now the proletariats or the workers were getting exploited they were getting alienated in their workplace so he believed that two classes would emerge one would be the haves that is the bourgeoisie and the second would be the have nots and the have nots would develop a class consciousness and they would revolt against the bourgeoisie this revolution would be known as the proletarian revolution and which would eventually lead to a classless society those who belong to the left wing ideology they believe in marxism and its different forms there were many leaders also who followed marxism and made a few changes these were lenin stalin mao zedong so the people who came after these leaders they followed marxism in one form or the other like leninism stalinism or maoism the left wing extremism it refers to a militant and violent armed struggle or naxalism where does the word naxalism come from it comes from a village known as naxalbari in west bengal in 1967 there was a left wing revolt to take control of the political power the people who were involved in this revolt were known as the naxalites or the maoists they were mainly the peasants and the tribals they followed marxist leninist ideology and the style of warfare of battle was guerrilla style what is guerrilla style warfare it refers to ambushes ambushes means surprise attack you hide and then you attack suddenly and catch the enemy unaware they are also involved in raids or sabotages that means destruction of public commodity so when we look at the ideology that the naxalites embrace it is the marxist leninist ideology in this ideology we have two classes one is the bourgeoisie or bourgeois elite and second is the proletariat the naxalites they are in favor of the proletariat or the masses they believe that the proletariats have been exploited by the state or the bourgeois and they claim to fight for these landless workers these landless workers they have access to minimum wages they also lack basic amenities such as health care education and the naxalites they want to achieve equity in society by means of a mass movement and struggle they want to dismantle the current government and they want to come in power and then bring a communist society the state as a retaliation has frequently deployed security forces in order to control or contain the naxalites but the rebels they have fought back like in the recent incident that we found that there were many casualties and their ambush resulted in the death of many security personnel when we look at the spread of naxalism we find that though it started with only a few states like andhra pradesh jharkhand chatisgarh and bihar it has now advanced to other hilly and forest areas in all these areas it has hampered the economic development it has forced the administration to stop any development work 
it has destroyed schools railway tracks and it has taken control of the mineral rich isolated regions the area where it operates is known as the red corridor because of its violent nature its militant nature naxalism has proved to be an internal security threat it has led to the deaths of not only security personnel but also civilians it has led to the displacement of people because they are not allowing development in those areas that is why people are now migrating to other areas which are developed they have also destructed destroyed schools trains railway lines they have disrupted elections and it can be found or it is understood that they have somehow lost track of their ideologies they started with demand for equal rights demand for equity and justice for the unprivileged the downtrodden but now they have turned violent they have controlled tribal bells and they have also resorted to extortion from rich landlords as well as businessmen and day by day the number of killings has been rising but why has it survived for so many years for so many decades usually when a social movement starts with a certain aim then gradually it either becomes an enduring organization or it fades away but this has not happened with the naxalbari movement or naxalism it has survived for over four decades why there are several reasons for this India is a mixed economy we have encouraged the public as well as private sector in our economic development and because of the need to develop to become a developed economy we have increasingly opened our doors to foreign trade we have contributed immensely in globalization we have also modified different social institutions according to the needs of the world we have given preference to the tertiary sector to outsourcing we have given importance to fdi foreign direct investment we have given importance to industry and this has had adverse consequences also because of the need for rapid industrialization and urbanization people have been displaced development induced displacement has happened of millions of people and it has not been supported with proper rehabilitation measures or measures for livelihood because of which people have sunk into poverty unemployment and mortality rate has also increased among the poor these adverse situation has given an opportunity for naxalism to prevail they also have organized themselves and they have ensured funding and they have also maintained armed groups and because of the adverse situation the adverse socio economic situation of the poor of the downtrodden their ideology has inspired the youth it has served as a light in darkness and these are the reasons why 
Nakshalism still survives in India. But how do we tackle it? The current approach of the government has been to suppress Nakshalism forcefully. It has banned Maoist outfits, it has passed anti-terror laws, it has also encouraged preventive detention. All these measures have led to unrest among the Nakshals. So what could be the solution? Here the role of civil society is important. Civil society must step in. It must act as an independent mediator or negotiator. It should apply moral pressure on the Maoists. But at the same time, the government has another role to play. The government should encourage development but not at the cost of citizens. So the development should be citizen centric and it should aim at the elimination of social problems like unemployment, poverty and other injustices which still prevail in or which still persist in society. Only then can civil society apply moral pressure on the Maoists, on the Nakshalites to abide by the rule of law and adhere to the constitutional norms. In politics, if you see, dissent is very important. Why? Because different views, when they come together, then they lead to the growth of politics or growth of a government or growth of state. But at the same time, this dissent should be addressed peacefully. All the stakeholders should be taken into account. Protests which are peaceful in nature should be encouraged. Social movements should also be encouraged. And any kind of violence should be discouraged. Because if the needs or the demands of minority groups or the downtrodden the underprivileged are not met, they might lead to collective violence and finally give birth to a revolution. When we think of collective violence, it has been studied by many left-wing scholars and if we think of Nakshalism, it has been studied under subaltern studies by Ranajit Guha. What is subaltern studies? Mostly in Indian historians you would find that they focused on the Indian national movement and they wrote history from the perspective of the leaders of the movement. They did not look at history or they did not study from the perspective of the masses or the peasants and tribals who took part in different movements and revolts. The subaltern studies seeks to right this wrong and it studies history from the perspective of the peasants and the tribals. These peasants or tribals insurgents, they were mainly followers of Marxism and this is also evident in the Nakshalite movement or Nakshalism. In Veena Das, there is a chapter on collective violence. There it is written that we also need to look at the concepts of violence and power in South Asian political systems. Why? 
because while the state has the rational legal authority to use violence in order to maintain law and order private violence is strictly discouraged also sometimes the civil society is not independent and the boundaries between the state and the civil society get blurred because of which it cannot act as a neutral negotiator or neutral mediator between the state and the rebels so all these things should also be pondered upon you can read the subaltern studies by ranjit guha from the book bk nagla so in summary we can say that we started off with the concept of politics and different ideologies we also learned about power and authority we learned about left center and right and how there is dissent in politics because there are some sections of people who are not satisfied with the present state of affairs or the present government they also want to be a part of the power elite and sometimes when their needs or demands are not met they resort to violence or they are involved in armed revolt in order to obtain power these are mostly the followers of marxism and these are also studied by left wing scholars under subaltern studies and finally the solution that we can think of is that the state should act along with civil society civil society which is neutral and the state should promote citizen centric development along with a secure environment to achieve this development there are few books that you can read you can read nakshalism from social problems in india by ramahuja or the collective violence chapter from veena das or subaltern studies by ranjit guha from bk nagla this is all for today we hope you have understood the concept of nakshalbadi movement thank you and all the best if you have any queries please post them at brainstorming sociology and for any updates please follow our channel at deciphering sociology thank you so much